on my part, I got um, involved in writing the chapters about the academic literature and to consolidate that. I didn't necessarily always find that a very easy job, but it was also to push a bit the conventional thinking. So what that, those chapters cover is very much related to the box, um, the B box. <laughs> Can I go one back? that Alan pointed to, if we have made some improvements into companies as well as governments moving into that box B up there, it's still no easy job. And, and uh, the three chapters on the literature um, contribute, uh, basically um, uh, link to that. So the three chapters are covering the a stock take of the resource curse uh, and propagating that the curse is um, of, there is also a curse of a one size fits all, uh, one size fits all uh, fix that some of the initiatives, international initiatives have um, uh, uh, perhaps focused on. Then there's a chapter on political economy and governance and a chapter on industrial policy, a new industrial policy in the extractive industries. Um, the the first chapter was written by uh, our colleagues from Chatham House, Glyde, Glada Lan and uh, Professor Paul Stevens, and they essentially asked the question, what do, we, what do we really know about extractives and economic development, looking at the literature going back, so to really evaluate where we are there. And they take stock, there was a growing interest in extractives and development from the 1990s onwards, with initially a strong emphasis on all the bad outcomes associated with the extractive industries and various hypotheses around why that was so. Um, that prompted then the question, how could we overcome those negative outcomes? What would be the sorts of uh, remedies, medicines that countries could be prescribed to, to, turn, uh, to, to make something better out of their extractive industries? And the notion of good governance, good institutions, usually used uh, simultaneously, uh, came up as the, revenue, uh, as the remedy. And, uh, that allowed us to turn towards a more positive story of extractives-led growth, uh, which underpins ultimately uh, many of the international initiatives, uh, at least those that target national governments promoting best practices. But Paul and Gladalan say that there, we have a mixed record on what has been achieved with that and whether the proposed remedies have actually worked. Um, and, and they see a challenge in the tendency to prescribe certain types of targeted measures that only focus on certain aspects of resource sector governance. Uh, and the argument there is that diverse contexts, as Alan has pointed out, and you don't compare Brazil with the DRC, demand diverse solutions and that uh, uh, should guard us against the, no, the quick fixes um, uh, uh, to what we might see as positive institutional change or better governance of the sector. And they point to two, three critical things that they see as important. Um, um, and from, from looking back is that fast project development, which is typically in the interest of the industry, is very challenging for, company, for countries because institution building, preparing the country for and taking trade-off decisions is, takes time. And the other argument is about diversification is key. You don't want to become more dependent on the sector, but ultimately success could be measured by how well you are diversifying from away from the extractive sector and can build domestic capital in whatever form in other that benefit other economic sectors. That's also the question about how to build linkages and perhaps the respective limitations of linkage building depending on the sorts of endowments that countries have and how fast or how well they can uh, uh, improve uh, in internal arrangements. Then the chapter on political economy and governance is perhaps a bit more a challenging one, but it, it very nicely fits to some of the things that uh, um, Professor Stieglitz and also uh, uh, Professor Basu were saying in, uh, as part of this conference. It takes on the proposition that good governance and good in institutions are a safeguard, or alone can be a safeguard against poor outcomes, by turning to the question, what do we know about positive institutional change? Because it's one thing to say we need good institutions. It's another way. It's another question altogether. How do you get there and what are the learnings? Partly, essentially, from, from history, um, how institutions in their complexity uh, can be changed within the context of particular countries. So it takes a bit of a critical view there on, on, on the sort of quick fix, you know, builds on the quick fix uh, 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 challenge that, that both Stevens and Gladalan emphasizes by also looking that some of the explanations why we have focused on good institutions and good governance have looked at structural, more structural variables to explain variance in outcomes across countries, but those variables are very difficult to change. They're usually hardwired, and so that sort of 
you know, doesn't offer immediate solutions. Though turning the question from how to prevent poor outcomes to what do we know about institutional, positive institutional change, it's not necessarily helpful, and I th think I heard that over the last two days, to look in the literature of economics. There is the historical e economists, the behavioral e economists, but also a lot in the, in, in the remit of uh, the science of public administration and from the, the wider social sciences about positive institutional change, which probably has, has got much less attention uh, uh, in the context of these questions that, that, that uh, we are asking about extractives and development. And so if one looks towards that sort of deeper literature and institutional, in, into that deeper sort of institutional literature and to inform us about what institutions are from a social science perspective, how they have come about and how they have uh, changed, we reach another level of complexity that, that, uh, that sort of guards us against uh, uh, looking for the quick fixes. And I guess that chapter then sort of is along the lines of what Professor Basu said is sort of analytical methodological because it then uses a framework from the historical uh, uh, economics, institutional literature from Oliver Williamson to point out some of the flaws and emphasize the deeper institutional improvements then often suggested are key to whether countries can transform, structurally transform their economies on the back of the extractive industries. And I very much heard that uh, resonating this morning too. Um, so the resource sector governance literature, as much as it has grown, has not actually offered too much help on these questions at stake. For example, how to diversify on the back of the sector in a particular context and with particular types of endowments. So I guess the good news is <laughs> we don't have all the answers. We can ask a lot of good questions still. Um, then the last chapter came about that at some point we thought, well, we need, there's a lot of talk about industrial policy. We better have a chapter in there about industrial policies and how they link to the extractives. So that's a bit of a broader literature review that looked at what the this newer literature on industrial policy says and what relevance it has for the extractive industries. Um, and so there's sort of three reasons why you know, I, I've seen industrial policy come back. One is because there's some disappointment with the proper development agenda that hasn't left, led to a thriving private sector. Particularly if you put that in the context of our main problem is to get jobs for people in less developed countries. Then there is a climate change concern, of course, calling for green industrial policy. So that's another sort of set of uh, literature that pushes in that direction. And then there is the disappointment more generally with uh, neoliberalism and, and, and globalization. Um, uh, pushing for proactive industrial policy and the, the, the role of the state, particularly developmental states, uh, and bringing up that. But there's no consensus because the opinions are still divided. And as we have seen over the last two days, there is a lively debate on that now. And so uh, at best, I could pick up a number of themes that, that run across this literature, such as how Worried are we about the risk of state failure versus the risk of market, market failure, the process of discovery and learning, what provides opportunities for learning, Joseph Stieglitz's paper covers some of that. Then setting and issuing, uh, uh, pursuing socioeconomic ob objectives, yeah, the all of government approach that Catherine will talk about, how to improve productivity, comparative advantages, which this morning were pointed out, they are immobile, so it's not only natural resources, it's also insti it's the institutional environment, the, the other forms of domestic capital, and then the political economy of institutional change. So I, I, I guess the conclusion is that, well, at this point, the internet, the industrial policy debate raises more questions for the extractive than it provides answers, but it points us into certain directions. If we look back, we have trajectories of the phases that the extractives have, where the extractives have been related to industrial policy, such as the promise of state-led industrialization, trust in sector liberalization, so in, looking backward. Much of the debate uh, is, is around complying or defying comparative advantages, and I guess what we see there is if you comply with them, you look at, you focus on the natural resources, but at the same time, the diversification means you have to build other types of advantages on the back of it. There's a local content discussion, which essentially is industrial policy by a different name, but it takes a very specific, narrow focus on backward linkages, which I think is not that helpful. We ought to broaden that out and look uh, um, uh, much wider. And then there's the environment policies and the green, green economy, where um, essentially structural transformation at every level is required, affecting the extractive resources differently, and there'll be winner and losers, and not least it will be driven by the investment choices of the financial sector that drives that drives towards more renewables. So in, in summary, uh, as I said, there is more questions for us to ask and perhaps less we should be conscious that we don't have all the answers.